Hello and hello and welcome everyone. Hang on. I don't know what happened. Go live now. I didn't touch it again, but it just threw mm -hmm. me out. I believe you are live now. Yeah, we are we're live now. Great. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Darup Sethave and I'm the founder and CEO of the Digital Economist, which is a global impact platform focused on building the products, knowledge, services, and programs for a human-centered digital economy. And we have a very interesting group of people here today, um, all focused on AI in varying capacities um, and super excited to be hosting this panel today, um, which is focused on the potential of AI and, but also sort of the downside. So we'll kind of go pretty deep in some of the areas uh, across, the, across the spectrum. So with that, um, I welcome again, and I would love to invite the panelists to introduce themselves um, uh, for two minutes and let us know uh, what you're focused on currently in the initiatives that you're driving. So maybe we can start with you, Santosh, Cam, and, and Ben in that order. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. This is uh, Santosh Kaveti. Um, I'm a CEO and founder of a technology services firm called ProArc. Uh, we're based out of uh, Atlanta. Um, we do business in the US, UK, uh, and in India. We have a small team of about uh, 350. Um, we do quite a bit of work in cloud data, and of course, AI and cybersecurity. Um, you know, just like cloud is becoming the underlying theme of most of what we do, what we are seeing in our practical experiences, so is AI. Um, automation and especially AI powered automation is becoming you know, pervasive in all the areas um, of the business uh, internally for us and for our customers. Um, so I'd love to share some experiences and you know, have a good discussion here. Over Thank to you, Santosh. Appreciate it. Cam? Hello, my name is Cam Hosman, CEO of Everest. Uh, I have been involved with technology world for past 25 years in, in various capacity, building products, investing in companies, co-founding companies. Uh, recently, uh, the focus that I've had is centered around application of AI in finance, basically using machine learning to make decisions on trading. Uh, you know, in the world of trading, we have heard about uh, technical analysis, uh, high frequency trading, but I think the focus that we have now is to look at all aspects of data from sentiment analysis on what people say on Twitter, Reddit, and Discord to the actions that they take on, you know, the content they watch on YouTube and also their past performance on how they have applied their knowledge to make trade. If you combine all that, it creates a mastermind on how the market makes trading. And the area that we have looked at is all asset classes, but currently the decentralized uh, cryptocurrency um, has been kind of the most um, promising as far as responding to the machine learning model. Um, I'm also involved in other aspects of AI, specifically on uh, food. Um, I've also done things related to transportation, uh, co-founded a car company, but in relation to food, uh, we are looking at food uh, manufacturing on a vertical farming and containership. And there's a lot of AI and sensors involved in that. So. Glad to be here in this gathering. Thank you. Thanks, Cam. Ben, would love to hear from you. Yeah, so I've been working on AI in various aspects since mid 1980s, uh, starting from mathematics uh, background in uh, academia, but doing things in industry for the last, uh, I guess, 25 years or something. And, and uh, you know, I've been pushing for most of my career as a researcher toward general intelligence. We're not there yet. I think, however, the AIs that are rolled out in the economy now have more general intelligence than, than 10, 20 years ago. So we're, we're sort of inch, inching toward general, general intelligence. And I've been exploring the practical aspects of this gradual progress toward general intelligence in a bunch of different 
different vertical markets ranging from uh, humanoid robotics with the Sophia robot that made with Hanson Robotics to finance, uh, both traditional and decentralized finance, me medicine and, and genomics. And I've, I've been looking at how to sort of catalyze creativity in the whole AI industry by using blockchain to create a decentralized AI platform, which is, is a singularity net. And I, I think, you know, all these different threads, the progress toward general intelligence in different vertical markets, the decentralization of this progress, these are all going to be coming together in a powerful way in the next uh, next few years, really, which uh, we're going to see a lot of increasing innovation in AI and triggered by AI, which will be interesting to talk about a bit today. Hmm. Let's pick it up there. Um, I'm personally very fascinated by the idea of singularity. There's also a singularity university, right, if I'm not wrong. So I know there's a lot of ink that has been spilled on this over the past 10 years on how it's all going to come together. And there's the whole sort of transhumanism as well. Um, convergence dynamics are part of our mission statement, so I, I feel very close to it. Um, but I'm kind of curious to see, and, and, and I think that's also spot on in terms of when we're looking at innovation, which is... Um, is there enough reason to believe that there would be general purpose, public good AI helping uplift, you know, the world versus just a, a handful of initiatives competing to get the, to extract the alpha, I guess, let's use your term, uh, Cam, here, um, and, 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 you know, uh, have that sort of comparative edge, uh, disadvantage, uh, dis disadvantageous edge on, you know, where the world stands. Uh, so, you know, big, big open question, uh, just throwing it out on the panel, uh, whoever wants to pick it up, but uh, I'll share some of my take, I guess, towards. Yeah, I, I think that in, uh, so I, I am largely in agreement with my friend, Ray, Ray Kurzweil, that we're going to, within the next few decades, we're very likely to get general intelligence at, at the human level and, and beyond. And I, I do think this will solve a lot of the problems that now seem intractable to us from material scarcity to uh, me mental illness to unification of, of, of physics and that right, right on down the list. And I, I, I tend to agree also with uh, a bunch of transhumanist thinkers that this is perhaps a bifurcation point in the history of, of, of humanity. I mean, this is a, this could create something that will appear relative to our current lives, utopic, although there will certainly be pluses and minuses that we, that we can't fully understand right now. And there are also dystopic possibilities. I mean, in, in, including AI that decides human beings are an inefficient use of mass energy or dystopic situations where a few fascist dictators control AIs to exploit everyone else. I, I see no reason to believe that dystopic options are more likely than utopic ones. I also think we should all have a great respect for our own ignorance in the face of these possibilities. Like We, we can't really project with a high level of certainty what's going to happen any more than cavemen could could project whether, you know, Microsoft or Netscape was going to win a browser war or something. I mean, we're, we're talking about about situations far beyond our, our, our current situation. It seems rational to me that we can bias the odds of a singularity in a positive direction. So, I mean, if we, if we can make the transition from today's narrow AI to tomorrow's general intelligence happen in such a way that the AGIs as they emerge are doing beneficial things like medicine, science, art, uh, teaching, social work, rather than say selling, killing, spying, and financial exploitation. So if, if we can make it so the emerging AGIs are mostly doing beneficial and helpful things in a decentralized and de democratic way, being sort of raised up by a vast mass of people, I think the odds of a beneficial outcome are more favorable but I don't think we can make a really super accurate prob probability estimate of how the singularity is going to come out. And I think we're going to see a lot of chaos en route from, from here to here to singularity. I mean, like in, the, in any complex system approaching a big bifurcation, you, you see a lot of chaotic stuff happening. And then 
from our own individual points of view as just as human beings or as, as business people. I mean, on the one hand, if we're only, say, one to three decades away from a singularity, it's already the end game. What happens in the next few decades is, is in most respects, not relevant from, from a historical view. On the other hand, it's highly relevant from our own personal view, right? So I think that there will be an art to there will be an art to surfing the chaos that that unfolds as we go through the path path to singularity, which is an interesting yeah. Well, I guess that's why we're here. Path. Yeah, you know, figuring that path to the through the chaos. I uh, would love to hear from you, Cam and Santosh, as well. Uh, I know we picked it up from the deep end, um, so feel free to bring us back to where things stand currently when it comes to AI. Yeah, when I was at the investment conference, I had mentioned to a few traditional investors that our focus is on the machine learning for trading. And the response was, how can I trust a system that is a black box? Because we have mandate to explain why we decided to pick a specific stock. And if we are not able to describe that decision making, it's a liability for us. But I think it's going to get to the point that the machine are going to become almost like a calculator that is going to give all the data to the trader and the trader will execute the trade instead of, you know, kind of becoming lazy and just mm-hmm. walking away. So and humans and machines working together. Human and machine working together and actually machine constantly telling us what data they need. Because if it says, if it give you this data, I can give you this return. I can give you this result. Um, I think in general, it's going to change the way people do trading. It's going to change the people like doctors do uh, healthcare, you know, uh, recommendation. So that's kind of how I see that we're going to have a hybrid solution. So Mm -hmm. it's going to help us learn faster new topics that we didn't know anything about it. I would I would echo what Ken said. Uh, no, I mean, we solve today. You know, we use AI is not the future anymore, right? We actually solve practical problems. Um, we we implemented AI to understand and make supply chain more efficient, knowing all the the issues that we're going through at the moment. In supply chain. We've addressed. Uh, how to manage the labor, again, knowing all the, the issues we now have in the world with labor management and with the great resignation and everything. We've uh, applied uh, AI in the food chain and how to make the, the food more sustainable from farm to all the way to the fork. Um, so we are able to solve some complex problems uh, that are for the beneficial. Uh, and the model that we currently have in place is what can occur, which is, it, humans and machines working together, leveraging machine learning algorithms or neural networks and computer vision. We've applied uh, AI to aid psychiatrists and psychologists in, 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 in understanding a bit more about the behavior and what's happening. Um, this is the current model. Um, I think that will continue to evolve. Now, I am looking forward to this the state you know where Ben uh, is foreseeing in the future where AI becomes you know, becomes uh, even more per- pervasive, like omnipresent in a general intelligence state where it's, it can make these decisions. And how do we evolve as humans to adjust to that state if something is right, probably going to be very chaotic. There's a lot of learning and unlearning to do. Um, you know, but at the moment, I would say it's, AI is helping uh, more than hurting. Um, and because we're working together, AI is giving the data and, and, and still, for the most part, humans are making the decision. And they are the ones who are executing their sense, intuition, instinct and judgment and saying, OK, this is the right, right. thing to do or not. Hmm. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. I, I know there are these two camps, just like there are two camps in the world around cats and dogs. You got to fall in one of these. Um, but, you know, it, is it necessary to have the pain and the chaos along the way, um, you know, or is there a way to avoid that and actually focus on some of these core issues that Cam, you started to scratch the surface on around trust, um, around the ability to uh, reliably 
uh, take decisions, uh, the more interconnected we are, the greater the, um, you know, the, the risk um, factor as well, right? When we, uh, when we look at systems that are further integrated and have greater mm. complexity and interdependence, uh, you're now looking at greater loss. And, uh, you know, uh, it's funny because, of course, with the pandemic, that's kind of clear to the world, um, unless you don't believe in uh, in the pandemic. But, uh, you know, you go to college and you do your first computational model, you have a little agent-based model, and, you know, the, you let one rate agent run wild, and you very clearly see how it perpetuates in the whole system. And that kind of thing is hard to communicate to the general public. And it's going to have to be communicated some way, somehow. And sort of this backlash that is there that, oh, machines are going to take over our jobs, which is not new by any means. Um, right. And it's funny. One of the things that come to mind as all three of you were talking is this uh, Columbia Art School's initiative called Frankenstein AI. Uh, so, you know, I guess the name sort of does... Uh, does the, the, you know, the various issues we're looking at, so does justice to, you know, all that we need to resolve along the way. So I'd love to hear the panel's take on what that looks like, then simply say, well, there's... I, I mean, chaos is not necessary, perhaps, in a philosophical sense, in the, in the same sense that human human cruelty and man's humanity to, to man's inhumanity demand may not be necessary, but it seems to be the way humanity is rolling, right? So, I mean, look, look at, say, so we're, we're going to have truck driving obsoleted b- before, before long. I mean, that's, that's essentially a solved problem is driving trucks on the highway, right? So then when truck driving is obsolete, are we going to see riots involving truckers in various places, as we are now seeing riots involving truckers in, in, in Canada for different reasons, right? I mean, most probably you are. Now, so, suppose you have a brain implant, and some parents put a brain implant in their kid's head that makes the kid much better in school than, than all the other kids, right? Then you have some parents who are religious and believe it's an offense against God to put a brain implant in their head. I mean, are we are we all going to just live and left, let live and everyone be happy? Or are you going to have some issue? I mean, we've we've got very basic issues going on right now, like one country in Europe in, in, invading another, which appears completely un- unnecessary to me. So when, when we're still at a level where old style things like this are happening with great loss loss of life, and, and I mean, it's, it's hard for me to see how human society is going to deal with the one-by-one obsolescence of every existing job category and the fundamental transformation of what it is to be human without some sort of issues, issues erupting. It's not so much that the issues are caused by the technology, it's that human society is full of tension and conflict and you're putting new technologies into it and you're just causing existing problems to to erupt. And there there's going to be amazing business opportunities and creative opportunities among all this mess, just just as there, there there's going to be, you know, tremendously bad things happening to many people. And I, it's it's not the way I would I would. Uh, Designed a universe, frankly, but but I, I, I wasn't asked. So, Fair you know, enough. <laughs> to follow up on what Ken is saying, uh, AI is a great force in technology, much stronger than what we had in computational uh, science in the past 20 to 30 years. If you don't grab it, someone else will grab it and use it against you. So might as well you start educating yourself, especially uh, I've said this to many women that want to get involved in uh, the technology to not go through the traditional path and, you know, learn, you know, Java programming and then go into low embedded if that's something that interests you. Just bypass that and just jump into the machine learning and AI because soon you're going to have a system that build themselves through guidance of the human operator. So solving problem becomes more important than learning the technology details. And that's, I think, would be a good uh, uh, empowerment tool, especially for those that 
come from behind. They haven't had exposure to technology as much as possible. Because, you know, to me, machine learning is such a brand new space that once you start learning it and focusing on it, others don't have an edge on you. But if you go through the existing traditional, uh, you know, computer science program, then you're not able to. And I know a lot of, you know, colleges are still on the traditional path, but it's better to focus on what is really the future of computing, which, you know, system that actually built themselves. But still you need human to describe the problem statement. Right. Well, you know, I hope everybody makes a note of that. Uh, what Cam, you just said, just dive in. But I'll just add here and say it's it's, it's not just about, I guess, empowering uh, so-called minorities. It's that we need those voices. We need that diversity. Otherwise, we keep perpetuating the same problems that we are trying to solve, right? Uh, war being a primary example. I mean, it's not wrecking for the whole world, you know. You're checking your phone every 10 minutes uh, on sort of how things are evolving. And it's um, it's interesting, right? The, uh, to your point, and I can see that, um, Ben, uh, which is as technology is involved, the greater interdependence there is, the more issues are going to pop up too because now they're in our faces. It is everybody's issues, what otherwise was ignored. Um I have a lot more to say, but this panel is on AI and the innovation in AI. <laughs> so, um, you know, we'll kind of uh, continue the focus on that. Uh, Santosh, any thoughts there uh, before we switch gears to some of the other realms that I want to bring in around trust and, and uh, the legal landscape? Yeah, well, I, you know, I was going to add to what Ben said earlier, uh, which is um, the next evolution of AI, which is inevitable. You know, we're going to you know get there. Will will inherently have or pose that conflict. Um, it may look as chaos to us. I personally think it's just a natural step in the evolution to the next phase, whatever that is. And and he's as he rightly said, we cannot predict. Um, we can try to improve and try to try to see how we can make AI more trustworthy. Uh, but in the long run, it, it's 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 not easy. It's not easy to to, you know, once it gets to a phase of general intelligence, um, I don't know if we can actually imbibe trust into it, um, you know, uh, as, after, as the fact, in a, right. after the fact. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, personally, uh, I think we don't want to make light of the issues that arise along the way, right? Like there are people who have been killed because of rumors on WhatsApp, for example. Uh, and, and so, you know, when tech is built by a certain group of people who don't have a notion of what it is to be in a different environment, and by the way, we're more impacted by environment than we believe. Uh, so that's another one of the ideological biases of just the way, I guess, humans have evolved cognitively. Um, you know, we're talking about real issues, real lives. So, you know, just to dismiss it and say, oh, there would be some pain along the way is um, um, it's not the most humane stance to take. That's, I guess, my two cents on it, um, right? And same thing goes for, like, you know, war at scale, for example, as well, which is the times we are in as we speak. Um, it's almost interesting that, you know, things have actually, well, quite a bit, and I almost kind of see this as a staged uh, stage in the sense uh, you know, tech has actually evolved quite a bit when it comes to um, the the if you want to actually be on the offensive side, but we're still seeing this unfolding over days and weeks. So, I mean, I'm curious to hear, you know, as we kind of dive into some of these other issues, um, what are the key areas that we need to look at to ensure that we build responsible AI uh, in a way that it does become a general purpose technology, much like electricity or the internet um, or telecommunications um, versus um, just uh, kind of an arms race, if you may. So open question to the panelists. Hmm, well, I, I think if if you look at the, the theory of open-ended intelligence, which is described in the 
PhD thesis of my friend uh, Weaver from Global Brain Institute at Free University of Brussels. I mean, at a very foundational philosophical level, it looks at an open-ended evolving intelligence system as being driven by two complementary yet contradictory forces. One is basically individuation, which is a system trying to reinforce its own, its own boundaries and you know survive in the form that it now is. The other is self-transcendence, which is the tendency of the system to grow beyond itself and re- re- revolutionize itself and di- di- disrupt itself, right? So I think humanity has both of those tendencies and for an AI system to transition into an AGI with power at the human level and beyond, it will probably have have both of those tendencies also. And, the, you know, both of those tendencies could have their dangers associated with them. I mean, if an AI individuates too much, it may just want to survive itself and, and squash everyone. On the other hand, if an AI self-transcends in an unpredictable way, we don't know where it's going to go. But if you look at the effect of AI in human society, you can see various human groups are using AI to foster their own in- individuation. Basically, a company wants to make more money than every other company. Country wants to assert hegemony over other countries or over the people in that country via espionage and so forth. And that's that's a key thing of what AI is now being used for, right? Is to reinforce the boundaries around a company or or, or a, a, a country for the individuation of that entity. And I think innovation AI, fundamentally creative AI, is getting shorter shrift right now. And that that's more about AI, you know, working within its own boundaries and within human groups to help them self transcend and, and grow into something something radically novel and you you need that if you want ai to lead scientific innovation because science is about making totally new discoveries no one no one envisioned right so i've been working among other things on ai for longevity biology if ai is going to cure human aging i mean it's not just about crunching data in a new way it's about coming up with new integrative hypotheses that no one has, no one has thought of before and in the art space say we've been long, working uh in the metaverse space with a project called so- Sophia Dow and in the music space with a project called Jam Galaxy, which are spinoffs of, of, of Singularity Net. There, the bottom line is current AI is very derivative, right? I mean, you train models based on existing images or, or music. It can generate cool sounding things. It, it, it's not going to be a Jimi Hendrix, a Thelonious Monk, a Grandmaster Flash, whatever you want. I mean, it's not, it's not going to come up with something really new that's never been, been seen before. And that's because of limitations of the narrow AI algorithms being being used now. So I, I think really AI is dialed a bit too much toward preserving the individuation of certain, you know, tribalistic entities now. And we should turn the dial more toward AI that can fundamentally creatively innovate and, and make up wild new stuff. And the, the risk there, of course, is you don't know what the AI is going to do. On the other hand, the risk in AI being used to to push forward nations and, and, and companies as, as its prime directive is that before we even get to the singularity, the AI is going to cause a lot, a lot of damage through helping these very narrowly oriented entities to, to, to achieve, achieve its goals. But so I would say to wrap that up, like just as each of us humans is stuck between trying to individuate and survive and trying to self-transcend and grow, and there's dangers in each. I mean, we see AI as it comes out with both of these aspects, and and there and there's dangers in each, and you can't. Well, it makes sense because humans have created really AI, tension, right? I mean, you can't you right. can't resolve that tension. That's mm-hmm. a sort of dialogue tension that that drives forward evolution, both, both natural and yeah. technological. That actually is not too far away from what I think the Vedas were writing five thousand years ago. Not a lot has changed, it seems, but. Um, Fascinating. I see a little doggy ears down there, uh, which is delightful after all this serious conversation. <laughs> all right. Well, then, if you're going to show a dog, I'm, I'm going to show off my robot. All right. There this you is go. officially my best, uh, most fun Harasses panel so far. So, yeah, uh, I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know who's cuter. We could have an audience vote. Yeah. But the, the dog, right. The dog, the dog's got better ears, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. But the but robot has loudspeakers in her in her breasts. So no, hair but, are important. I mean, that's, a, that's, a <laughs> that's the other thing I'd but say. I've seen, uh, you know, I've met Ben a few times, and Sophia gets a lot of attention because when 
when you have a robot that is almost like a human like i'm not saying like human, human a humanoid but, but yeah and it it gets a lot of attention because the emotion that you have on the facial expression uh gets gets human to kind of feel like oh this it, re- is- it really engages people yeah we we had the sophia robot work as a meditation guide we found about 30% of people were nudged into a fairly profound trance state by meditating with the robot which is not about agi right it's a, it's about human human robot experience but then what happens when there's even some general intelligence behind, behind that robot that's being the meditation guide it's it's is it is is quite quite interesting and there's not much of the plants resources going into this sort of application of 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 ai there's a lot more going into yeah. there's a lot more going into automated drones and government espionage But right. one thing that uh, Navruvi mentioned about trust, I mean, AI could actually bring something that its effect would be amazing for humanity. The concept of DAO, decentralized autonomous organization, the smart contract. Yeah. Uh, if you are able to bring AI to be almost that other co-founder, that imagine four of us have a company, and then we have a fifth co-founder that. kind of regulates how we work together the chance of success of our company will be increased significantly because mm-hmm. it's independent and we all gave our votes to that entity saying okay we want you to make decision when we are not in agreement if that could happen and we will have more successful companies that i think is the best application of ai it's not removing human from the loop it is guiding us to work better together for a bigger problem because today as you know 95% of companies fail if not more. i don't think a compassionate ai would want to remove humans from human loops right i mean any more than i want to stop dogs from interacting with each other or something right i mean even if the ai could solve it's a good analogy eh? even if the ai could solve <laughs> physics problems and math problems better than us I mean humans want to be humans like I, I want to play music together with other people even if an AI could play more more perfect music than 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 I could I could right so a, a beneficial loving AI which was raised in a compassionate way by by human beings is going to want humans to continue to create and have spiritual experiences and have social experiences and create products and artworks for other humans because that's that's what humans need to do to feel to feel a sense of 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 purpose it's, so it's not about whether the ai could do it better or not or not really but it, but this will be a major shift in the economy not not nonetheless right you're talking about a shift from humans doing stuff because they have to to get resources to not die a shift to humans doing stuff because it fulfills sort of parts of their mind that are higher up on on, on the maslow hierarchy than, than than survival right and this is this is a significant economic shift which will happen unevenly across the world and this is one of the worries you have like who once once ai is no longer needed for manufacturing or mining like who gives universal basic income to people in the central african republic right like there you you could see there being a period of time when ai has uplifted parts of the world economically to a tremendous degree the the global economy hasn't permitted that to diffuse widely throughout the world and then what what sort of chaos unfolds if 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 that's the case right so i mean there's right so i think yeah i think there there are a lot of assumptions there it's almost like um speaking from a more economics perspective there's an assumption that the economic incentives remain the same but technology changes uh but you know we're talking about kind of a distant future into the and it is the future could be 10 years from now yeah or it could be you know no, um, it, i mean if you listen to kurzweil we'll have human level ai by 2029 which i think is pretty realistic and then uh, then after that all, all, all bets are off so this is the nature of exponential change is that what's distant by some measures doesn't have to be distant in terms of time Right, I right. also think that in, in you know in the interim as we're going through this this evolution there probably is going to be some regulation and policy making 
that will by, 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 by the UN. I mean, this is global. I mean, so. who, who, based on who we are, it could be like GDPR. I, I foresee countries or entities coming up with policies to regulate well, AI. There will be, but how, but how is GDPR doing in, in China, Russia, Kazakhstan, and the Mon- Mongolia, Ethiopia? I mean, it's 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 a big world, right? So the the issue is if having more and more advanced AI gives significant economic advantage to whoever owns or is allied with the, with this AI, then there may be limited appetite to adopting regulations that greatly restrain competitiveness. But yet we can't even regulate like money laundering and, 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 and rich, rich people hiding their money in, in offshore accounts. So if we can't even regulate that globally, I can't see how we're going to regulate emerging super intelligence globally in an effective way. At least that, that 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 would be my view. Of course, I'm I'm a I'm kind of a crypto cowboy. You'd expect I'd think that way. Right. right. No, I there, maybe I I, I there don't. There is think a question that... here. Um, oh. just one second here, Sintho. Since we have a few minutes left, I do want to make sure if there's a, a relevant question here, we take that up with uh, from uh, Ishu, if I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, looks like it's for you, Ben. What's your what are your thoughts on outdated humans? Um, uh, and curious to hear, I, I don't think I followed the question fully. Uh, do you mean humans that are not really adding value to the global economy? Or that all humans, or does he mean all humans are out of date? I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, oh. I'm 55. I'm arguably an out of date human already. But, but, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, 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 I think that to answer that in a couple senses, I mean, I think as singularity approaches, most young people are going to take to it very naturally. And you, mm-hmm. you will have more difficulties of adaptation from people in, in, in my, my age bracket, certainly, which will, will be overcome, particularly as the longevity drugs roll out and we can all rejuvenate ourselves and, and become young again with advanced technology. But that, that that's significant issue like you look in ethiopia where i have an office and i've done a lot of business i mean the the young tech geeks in Addis Ababa are ahead of people in in china u.s or western europe really but sure. you've got a lot There's of an opportunity probably. but you've got a lot of you know subs- illiterate subsistence farmers age 50 in in little villages and these people don't really have the, the mindset to embrace n- new technologies even even uh, once they you know that once the robots ro- ro- roll into their into their farms, so I think people will take differential amounts of time to catch up, which will be one of the sources of of the chaos between here and and singularity. And as far as all humans becoming out of date, which is a more interesting topic, I mean, I think I think we will each have an interesting choice at one point, like remaining a legacy human at the level that we are now will be an option, which is an interesting option because if if you could upgrade your intelligence <clears throat> by a factor of a hundred by connecting yourself to a super intelligent global brain, you know, would you do it? And at what rate would you make that transition? Because you'll be giving up what you are to embrace something in some sense yeah. greater than what you are. Yet, yet what you are has a certain integrity and, and beauty, just right. like a tree, a flower, you know, a, a cockroach, a dog or a chimpanzee does. Right. So you could, you can see both options being meaningful and you could also see taking two options, like make a copy of yourself. Let, let one of them become one with the compute matrix. Let the other remain a legacy human without, without perhaps the irritations of a uh, sickness, death and the need to work for a living. Right. So that there, right. there, there, so, there are a lot of interesting options and you can, you can see just working backwards from that. What will be the sort of, freaky business and personal opportunities to unfold along along the path to this sort of science, science fictional future. Right on. But now I'll take more dogs of it. Like that. Um, well, there's a lot of dogs to take. Go to the animal shelter. Yeah, you can take a lot of dogs. So. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Um, all right. So, Santosh, uh, go ahead. I think you had a comment there. Oh, I think what I was saying was um, this is my personal opinion, but this this comparison or categorization of of people or species based on certain perceived value is in my opinion flawed 
I could argue that I I can go sit in a farm, do nothing, and probably be more valuable valuable to the, the to the earth than a successful billionaire. Um, so, so so we need to be very careful not to you know use some perceived value and and even use out of date or you know. Yeah. I think it's a mistake to to call anything or anybody out of date, in, in my opinion. Thank you for that. Are you, st- think... you still programming COBOL? <laughs> um, actually, and I don't know if it's a good thing, bad thing, but we do, you know, <laughs> because majority of our bank and systems are still relying on the RPG yeah, and COBOL, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think. Like so I'll man, just like to have a, a, a last comment from, from Cam. I started on is arguably out of out of date, but I think on the other hand has its own beauty, right? So that that, that that's the that, that, that's the dichotomy. All right, uh, we have three minutes left in the in the session today. Obviously, to be continued and many books to be written. Uh, hopefully, you know, inspire so, young people to build a responsible future. Books are uh, out of date. Sorry, no, 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 no more books. Only no only, more books. Only, that too. Only, we only, only built memes. AI algorithms. Yeah, it's all, it's uh, all memes from here on. Great. There you go. Um, cool. We're very cool. Uh, I, I would say totally uh, to be continued and for the audience to feel free to reach out to us. Some really cool stuff. Everybody on the session here is uh, is doing. And Cam, we've got two minutes for your final comments. Um, and uh, we'd love to hear your take before we uh, before we say goodbye for today. Sure. Um, I mean, going back to the dogs, one of my friends that I think if he does what he is trying to build, he should win a Nobel Prize. He was in depression and he got a dog. And after that, he's actually calling his AI Lily, which is the name of his dog. So sometimes, going back to what Santush mentioned, when you become a human and you touch other sensory elements in your life, suddenly this amazing innovation comes in, love comes back to your life, and you're able to do amazing things. So the goal that I see for technology, for dogs, cats, is to help us become more human, think about bigger problems, work together as a team, uh, what I mentioned about having Dow to be our co-founder. Today, great number of companies fall apart because of the ego of the founders. And I'm not saying one founders, maybe. I mean, I'm involved with companies myself, and I can see the ego happening between me and co-founder in one of the companies that I have. Uh, we really need to have technology to be that uh, equalizer to bring us together and let us do bigger yeah. than save the humanity from all the challenges that we have currently and in future of itself i guess so i guess my biggest takeaway from the panel just to kind of wrap it up would be to say um what we always have known and often forget which is that we have choices and we should exercise those choices in a meaningful compassionate and um responsible way. So with that, uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. I had a, a very uh, fun and nerdy and uh, you know meaningful conversation and I hope you did as well. Um, and thanks to our audience for, for joining again. And once again, my name is Narub Sadev and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Narub. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks again. Thanks nice to meet you, Ben. Nice to meet you, Ken. <laughs>